Got a couple extra remarks today. Yeah. Oh, sure. You okay? Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna get started now. Today we have approximately 45 minutes and just as a reminder, one question, one follow-up. We have Dr. Brown, Dr. Yaffe, and Mr. Anderson here today. So I'll turn things over to Dr. Brown to get started. Great, thank you. And before we start reviewing numbers and charts today, uh, I wanna talk bluntly uh, with you about two critical issues that underpin all of the data I will share. The first is the spread of COVID-19. We are at a dangerous point. The number of cases in Ontario is growing between 3% and 5% almost every day. There are already more than 400 COVID-19 patients in our intensive care units and mortality in our long-term care homes is now on a pace to exceed the tragedy of the first wave. But as importantly, COVID-19 is now in every region of Ontario. This is no longer a problem of a small group of cities or one region of the province. More than half of our intensive care units in Ontario are full or have only one or two beds left. 40% of the long-term care homes are an outbreak. The pandemic will have serious consequences for our health in every region of Ontario. I know that the people working in our hospitals will do everything to help, to help cope with this crisis. Hallways will be used to house makeshift intensive care beds. Field hospitals will hold patients throughout the winter. But as we climb closer to a thousand intensive care beds, about half of our capacity filled with COVID-19 patients in February, we will have to confront choices that no doctor ever wants to make and no family ever wants to hear. They will be choices about who will get the care they need and who will not. There'll be choices about who receives oxygen or is transported to hospital. Decisions we are already seeing being forced on ambulance crews in California where the virus has spread widely. And I wanna emphasize that the choices will affect all patients needing intensive care, whether it's patients who have a heart attack, who've been in a motor vehicle accident, who have COVID-19, or any other cause. 
This also means care for thousands of patients waiting for surgery will be delayed or canceled while we add more patients to these wait lists. It is critical to remember that when care is delayed, patients get sicker and their prognosis worsens. Simply put, delays kill. At the same time, the impact in our long-term care homes is as or more devastating. We already have well over 1,000 deaths in long-term care in this second wave. We also have to acknowledge the anguish and the heartache of our most vulnerable senior citizens as they are cut off from their loved ones as long-term care homes struggle to keep the virus out. As you'll see from the maps I will show today, long-term care homes across the province are now affected by COVID-19 outbreaks. And as the virus spreads, so will the outbreaks, and so will the deaths. And I want to be clear, the impact on our health system is already greater today than we have ever seen in Ontario's history. If we look at just one community as an example, Scarborough has already had many times more emergency department visits and hospital admissions than in an entire bad flu season. We are now only a few months into the second wave. And as my colleagues have shown, using Ontario data, the impact of COVID-19 is far greater than diseases like flu or anything else that it's regularly compared to. And stakes have just been raised. We'll discuss today in the briefing a new variant of COVID uh, called NASB117 that has likely arrived from the United Kingdom. This variant is in the province right now. Today, the number of Ontarians with COVID doubles every 35 to 40 days, roughly every month to month and a half. But this new variant, if it spreads, will mean that the doubling time for cases could drop as low as 10 days. Now, the vaccine, and this, sorry, the, this new variant is not more lethal, but because it spreads so much more quickly, if it gets out into the community, there is no question that we'll have more cases and many more deaths. People will die from the virus itself and from an overloaded health system that is unable to respond to their needs. The second key issue for today is controlling the spread of COVID-19. As you will see in the upcoming slides, the majority of Ontarians are working to follow the public health restrictions. Thank you. Your actions protect yourself, but they also protect other Ontarians. I know this can be hard work, and I know this involves hard choices about seeing loved ones and friends. But our actions are key to controlling the spread of the disease. However, there remains a substantial number of Ontarians who are not following restrictions, and their actions will undo the hard work and effort of those Ontarians who do. If we do not follow these restrictions, COVID-19 will continue to aggressively spread before vaccines have the chance to protect us and this will have tragic consequences for us, for our health, for our province, and for our health system. The vaccine will come, and it will be in people's arms before uh, many of us really even understand how quickly it's moving. But that is still months away. We have a big job to do right now. Any restrictions will take time to have an impact, but stopping the growth of the pandemic is not impossible. Other countries have witnessed the same growth that we have, and they've taken action by enacting and enforcing higher levels of restrictions. And it has worked. The Australians celebrated New Year's Eve, and their shops are open. The French have cut their cases by half. And Germany is flattening its curve. But we must also support Ontarians, who by virtue of nothing more than the work they do and the communities they live in, face much greater risk of exposure to the virus. This means greater and more accessible testing, close engagement with community leaders, and support for people who do the essential work we all rely on every day, so that nobody has to choose between getting a test and putting food on the table. This means making workplaces as safe as possible. It means support for isolation when someone tests positive. It means income support, and it means protection from eviction. As I move into the numbers uh, in today's briefing, I want to say a special thank as well uh, to Dr. Beata Sander and her team who have been instrumental in producing today's and uh, many preceding briefings. And with that, I'm sorry, but the uh, 
sign language translation will disappear as we go into the slides, uh, and it will be back uh, as soon as we're finished presenting the slides. So key findings, uh, as we do uh, every day or every time that we make these briefings, I uh, want to just call attention to a few key issues. Uh, growth in cases has accelerated and is now over 7% on our worst days. Almost 40% of long-term care homes have active COVID-19 outbreaks. Uh, since January 1st, 198 long-term care residents and two long-term care staff have died of COVID-19. And our current forecast suggests that the deaths in wave two in long-term care will outstrip those in wave one. COVID-19 ICU occupancy is now over 400 beds. Surgeries are being canceled and the access to care deficit will continue with real consequences for health. Much of this is due to the fact that mobility and contacts between people have not decreased with the current restrictions. Survey data do show that the majority of Ontarians are helping limit the spread by following current restrictions. However, case numbers will not decline until more of the population follows their example. A new variant of SARS-CoV-2 called B117 could drive much higher case counts, ICU occupancy, and mortality if community transmission occurs. The doubling time for cases could drop by more than two-thirds. And just to make it clear, this variant is in Ontario. This is not a hypothetical. The variant is here. It's just depending now on how fast it spreads. And without significant reductions in contact, the health system will be overwhelmed and mortality will exceed the first wave totals before a vaccine has time to take effect. Uh, I'll move now to a chart that we show or start uh, each one of these uh, update briefings with, and this is the total new cases per 100,000 residents per week across public health units. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to see the dramatic recent growth as the slopes of those lines curve up quite strongly. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, all above, uh, all the uh, public health units are now above restrict, uh, and the majority uh, are above the control uh, line. So this is quite substantial growth. Moving on and looking at COVID-19 testing percent positivity across public health units. Uh, again, you can see the dramatic growth in a number of public health units there, and all are above that control level now uh, in the province. There is not a, a single public health unit, or not, sorry, any of the results that we present here uh, that are below that threshold. I think it's important to note that this is occurring despite strong testing volumes. So this is not an artifact of lower uh, or reduced testing. This is uh, persisting despite very strong testing volumes. Uh, I'll move on now to uh, percent of COVID-19 test results returned within two days across public health units. Uh, we often talk a lot about the variation across public health units. You can see this variation persisting uh, with rates going from about uh, the low 60s to just into the uh, high 90s percent. Fast turnaround of test results is critical to both helping people isolate at home so that they don't spread the disease, allowing people who are uh, negative to actually go about their work, uh, and as importantly, initiating case and contact tracing and helping control the spread. This is a, a number that's critical to fight. Uh, against the disease and one that uh, needs to uh, move upwards. Uh, moving on now, I just want to talk about the percent positivity by age group. Uh, we've truncated the chart a little bit here. We only go back to August now uh, to give a little better resolution on the data. Again, the darker the square, and each square represents a age group, uh, starting with the youngest age groups at the bottom, moving to the oldest age groups at the top. Each square represents one of those age groups. Uh, right at the top, you can see the 75 plus group, the most vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 infection. And you can see how that has darkened progressively over time. It's important to note though that all of these squares are darkening over time and every square is over 5% despite strong testing volumes. So cases continue to rise, percent positivity continues to rise, testing is stable. Uh, this means that the growth of the pandemic is uh, particularly acute right now. Uh, and at that point, that is, I think, no longer we can describe as precarious. It is uh, dangerous. Let me move now to spend some time focusing on long-term care. You can see the curve here of deaths and cases. Uh, I think it's really important to call attention to that uh, green curve, which is the cumulative deaths. Uh, this curve continues to become more and more steep. And as that curve becomes more steep, the number of deaths per day increases, or the number of deaths per week increases. Uh, and now, just thinking since January 1st, we've had 198 resident deaths uh, and two staff deaths. 
Really important to note that this is carrier curve has increased virtually every time that we've given this briefing. Uh, and given the growth in cases, it will likely increase uh, regardless of what we do, at least for a little while. I'd like to move now to some projections of mortality in long-term care homes. Uh, if you think that we had about 1,800 deaths uh, in the first wave, uh, we are now over 1,100 deaths. And under at least the worst case scenario, we would be looking at over 2,600 deaths by Valentine's Day, which is a significantly uh, higher number than the first wave. Uh, that blue uh, area behind uh, the red bars, the red bars are the uh, actual deaths. That blue bar is the range of our estimation. You can see that now it's not going to be anything lower than 1,100. And there's a very good likelihood, given that slope, that we will start to approach that worst case scenario with a substantially higher death count in wave two uh, than in wave one. I'd like to now move and start to show some maps of the progress of the uh, disease across the province. Uh, starting here on July 1st, uh, you can see the map there. Uh, every dot is a long-term care home in outbreak. And the size of that dot reflects the number of staff and residents who are infected in each outbreak. Uh, that gives you a picture of where we were at the start of the summer. Here we are at the uh, beginning of October, October 1st, 2020. You can see that the number, let me just go back to July here, the number of dots has increased and the size of those dots has increased as we go along here. And I'd like to take you now to really kind of today uh, or close to today, this is January 7th. You can see now that every region of the province has homes and outbreaks. You can see that the number of those outbreaks has increased and you can see that the size of these outbreaks is substantial. So important to uh, note that this is now spreading across all the province. And as we noted uh, in kind of my introductory remarks, as this spreads, so will cases and so will deaths. Moving now to mobility. Uh, I'll first talk about mobility around retail. Uh, this is what we, uh, we're using sort of cell phone and other types of data. We're able to understand where people are in terms of the types of places they're at. You can see that there was a very dramatic spike in retail before the Christmas holidays. This came down, people visiting retail areas. You can see, if you look very closely, that there are some gaps uh, or drops uh, in uh, visits to retail that happened just after the uh, lockdown measures are put in place, but not significant drops. And I think more importantly, it's really important to look at sort of an overall measure of mobility. Uh, the panel on the left-hand side of this chart is the changes in people's visits to workplaces. The panel on the right-hand side is changes in people staying at home. Uh, and you can see here across a number of public health units, really there is no change up until the actual Christmas holidays. And then it returns right back up to, uh, as, you know, at least as far as we can see from the existing data, right back up to the previous levels. So we're not seeing any real change in people staying at home. And I think it's important to note that this line is really flat since July, which means that we really haven't seen a break in mobility since probably the nadir or the lowest point of the pandemic, despite growing case numbers. I want to move to uh, some survey data uh, that has been uh, commissioned by the Fields Institute here and start to talk about people's behaviors. Great. So with current restrictions, almost two thirds of the population are acting in a way that will decrease COVID-19 spread. And so for instance, the top bar asks the question, are people in your neighborhood physically distancing? And about 25% say all the time, about 40% say most of the time or, or at least trying, but there are 35% who report that people in their neighborhood are occasionally or never physically distancing. And that's a key step in actually breaking the, uh, the transmission of the disease. Uh, looking a little more uh, into what will have been happening around the holidays here, in the last four weeks, how many people outside your household visited your house for a meal or a celebration or a stayover? About 32% of the population reported that three or more people visited the house. And for those who reported people visiting the house, a third did not observe restrictions such as mask wearing or physical distancing, which is key to actually preventing the transmission of the disease, particularly if this is indoors. So about two thirds of the population are working to try to break the spread of the disease, uh, but I think their efforts will go and be undone if uh, the entire province does not uh, pitch in here. 
Now, let me go on to projections here. Uh, as uh, before, what we do is we project uh, based on the existing or current growth in cases where we think it's going to go. Uh, you can see there that really with case growth between 3 and 5%, that's the uh, second and third line from the top, we're really pretty much exactly where France and the UK and the Netherlands are at the same point in their pandemic growth. And so we're facing the type of growth now that those jurisdictions have felt the need to take decisive action on to uh, restrict. Uh, I won't get into the um, overall case numbers save to say that if we do hit the 5% level of growth, which is quite possible, we'll be looking at over 20,000 cases a day uh, by the middle of February. And if we get into a, a darker situation with 7% growth, where actually we have seen some days at 7% growth, we'll be looking at over 40,000 cases per day. This, of course, unfortunately translates into dramatic reductions in intensive care use. Sorry, dramatic reductions in intensive care unit uh, capacity. And so we're already over 400 uh, beds. And by the end of the first week of February, even under a very optimistic scenario of 1% growth, we will have over 700 beds filled. If we're at a more reasonable range between uh, 3% and 5%, we'll be looking at 1,000 to 1,500 intensive care unit beds uh, occupied by COVID-19 patients. And obviously at that point, it's no longer <clears throat> a possible level of capacity to support because we are expending the majority of our capacity in intensive care taking care of uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, we haven't shown a 9% growth rate, which is what uh, is threatened by some of the growth that we've seen in other jurisdictions. Uh, but if we did, uh, the number would be an almost uh, impossible 2,000 intensive care units, uh, intensive care unit beds occupied by February 5th. Continuing on here, I want to show the slide on uh, intensive care uh, unit admissions and hospitalization rates overall. Uh, for the last several briefings, we've been reporting a roughly consistent growth in this number each time. Uh, you can see now that over the past four weeks, there has been a 72% increase in hospitalizations and a 61% increase in intensive care unit patients. Given the growth in cases, given the increase in percent positivity among our older age groups, this trend will continue uh, for a while. I'd like to now talk about the distribution of uh, these uh, intensive care unit beds across the province. It's important to note that we now have about a quarter of our hospitals with no ICU beds free, and another quarter have only one or two beds free. I think it's important to kind of present this because we're now looking at a situation where half of our intensive care units do not have the capacity to respond to emergencies, medical emergencies, whether it be for individuals like a heart attack or uh, emergencies that might affect multiple people, such as violence uh, or motor vehicle accidents. I also want to note that these hospitals facing crisis now are distributed across broad parts of the province. And perhaps as well also note that the hospitals that are most affected are also referral centers for the entire province. So this type of ICU occupancy compromises care across the province. This is no longer an issue of uh, one or two regions and it's no longer an issue of moving patients around to try to accommodate uh, access to care problems. I want to note here the uh, continuing access to care deficit. You will see a sharp blip up in the volume of surgery done over the Christmas holidays. This is a blip up, not in terms of absolute numbers in a way that would give us any comfort. This is compared to the volume of surgery over last year's Christmas holidays, which is typically a slow period. Uh, but you can see uh, with the close of the holidays, uh, that surgery uh, has actually started to decline substantially again below uh, 2019 levels. And just to kind of put this again into perspective for people, uh, when we start to delay care, uh, you know, most of the, uh, much of what we talk about in terms of tumor doubling time is measured in weeks. Cancers get larger, prognosis uh, gets uh, worse and patients will die. Uh, heart disease will worsen and patients will die as they're unable to get access to care. But perhaps as importantly, there is large swaths of our healthcare system that are similarly compromised, everything from mental health care, through to addictions care, uh, through to uh, care for chronic diseases. All these become compromised, and this builds up not only an access to care deficit, but a substantial health deficit that will persist and will be as inequitable or more inequitable uh, than the re uh, rest of the uh, pandemic. Of course, this translates not only to problems in access to care, it translates in problems in mortality. Um, daily mortality is increasing, uh, doubling 
if the trends persist, uh, to between 50 and 100 deaths per day between now and the end of February. Uh, to give you an uh, idea of this in relationship to other causes of mortality, this would really put uh, COVID-19 into uh, competition for being the single greatest cause of mortality on a daily basis uh, at that point, uh, potentially larger than cancer and heart disease. It's already larger than virtually every other cause that we look at, uh, but this will put it into uh, the first position uh, with very little opportunity from challenge. Now I'd like to talk about the new variant of COVID-19, uh, the B11, sorry, new variant of SARS-CoV-2, uh, B117. Uh, and this is the variant that appears to be much more easily transmitted. Uh, we look at it as probably being about 56% more transmissible. Uh, but we're pretty confident that this uh, increase in transmissibility, the ability for it to move around and infect other people is uh, at least 50% and maybe as high as 75% more uh, transmissible. Uh, fortunately, there's no increase in disease severity and the vaccines are, are likely still effective. But the critical issue here is as case numbers grow, as that transmissibility leads to higher case numbers, it does lead to more hospitalizations. It does lead to more intensive care unit uh, occupancy and it does lead to more death. It's not an issue of changing the rate. It's really an issue of changing the overall number. Let me now uh, talk about what this does to our modeling projections in terms of numbers of cases. Just advance the slide there, thank you. Um, if the SARS-CoV-2 variant B117 spreads in the community, the doubling time for cases could drop to 10 days in March. Now, what you see here in the blue dots is a series of scenarios that we're running around the current variant uh, of SARS-CoV-2, how uh, its transmissibility leads to growth in cases. And you can see uh, superimposed on that a black line. The black line represents what our models are predicting, uh, and the blue uh, dots represent all the different ways we've tried to run this scenario. As you can see right now, our models are functioning fairly effectively and doing a good job of predicting what the growth is. However, the red lines indicate the growth in new cases that would result from the new variant, B117. And you can see that if we've had a one case uh, introduced into Ontario in mid-October, even if there's a chance that two-thirds of any of these new cases introduced don't get transmitted at all, you can see that explosive growth in the red dots as the total number of cases take off and the uh, disease starts to get to almost near vertical growth in cases uh, the red lines or red dots obviously start to go vertical. The gray dots are the total number of cases, but you can see just how quickly uh, that uh, new variant dominates uh, the transmission and leads to a much, much higher uh, level of cases and a much, much faster uh, rate of transmission. Uh, one of the questions we get asked often is what are the key components of what other jurisdictions have done to try to curb this spread? Uh, you can see here, as we looked at, say, Victoria, France, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, or Netherlands, it's important to know as well that uh, United Kingdom, Germany, and Netherlands all have uh, these lockdowns in progress right now. Uh, Stay-at-home orders, restrictions on movement, uh, as we really saw in the first wave uh, here in Ontario, are a common element to all of them. You can see a number of elements about really kind of closing uh, non-essential uh, activities, uh, really strong attention to workplaces as well across all of these, uh, and the importance as well of enforcement of this. Now, it's I think important to emphasize the value of enforcement and making sure that people understand uh, what's going on and the importance of uh, adhering to uh, the public health restrictions. Uh, it's equally important to note, though, that it must be enforcement and support uh, so that people don't have to make choices that uh, no one should have to make about actually protecting theirs uh, and others' health. Returning now again to the key findings, uh, growth in cases has accelerated. Uh, it can no longer be described as precarious given the persistence of a uh, R above one. Uh, it's over 7% on the worst days, which is getting into our worst case scenario territory strongly. Uh, almost 40% of long-term care homes, or really 40% of long-term care homes have active COVID-19 outbreaks. And since January 1st, uh, almost 200 residents and two staff have died. Uh, our forecast suggests that this uh, rate of death will just continue uh, to accelerate and the cumulative death count will uh, is on track right now to outstrip that in the first wave. ICU occupancy is now over 400 beds, and our scenarios are predicting that this could easily double uh, by the end of the first week in February. Uh, mobility and contacts are not declining uh, as we would hope in order to break the transmission of the disease or the spread of the disease, 
Mobility levels are really staying very similar to what they were in July, uh, which means that the current restrictions will need to be augmented if the goal is to reduce case spread, reduce uh, the crisis within our health system, uh, and save lives. Uh, the new variant could drive substantially higher case counts. Uh, this will require hard, hard work in case and contact tracing. It will require public health capacity to be able to control uh, the spread of this new variant and the ability as well to identify this new variant uh, regularly uh, using uh, uh, sequencing. And without significant reductions in uh, contacts, the health system will be overwhelmed and the mortality will exceed the uh, first wave totals before a vaccine uh, has time to take effect. I'll just conclude by uh, noting the members here of the science and modeling tables uh, who uh, have contributed to this presentation and uh, all the preceding briefings. And I'm very proud that uh, they've been able to do this, uh, really freely giving of their time uh, as volunteers as they've, uh, as they've gone through on this. Uh, that concludes the briefing. I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Anderson to uh, touch on some of the issues uh, related to our health system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be brief. I know we'll want to get to your questions and answers. I just wanted to uh, really highlight uh, and echo uh, one of the many points that uh, Dr. Brown has made today uh, that is critical for us. Uh, and that is that when we're talking about the impact of COVID, we're not only heard Dr. Brown talk about the very serious impact that that has on. So really what we're talking about is that when we stay home, when we follow the public health measures, we're doing that not only to slow the progress of this disease, but we're doing it for all of those people who have those other illnesses, the non-COVID illnesses like cancer and heart disease, and we're doing it for them. It is imperative that we find a way to flatten this curve and not have the kinds of numbers that Dr. Brown has just presented as early as early February. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to your questions. We'll go to the phone lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. From Antonella Artuso at Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Doctor, in a race between uh, the variant and the vaccine rollout, shouldn't uh, why would you be so concerned that the variants would win? Um, shouldn't the vaccine program be far enough along to mitigate the worst case scenarios? Um, I'll start and then I don't know, maybe uh, Dr. Brown may want to add, but uh, first I do want to inform you that um, as of the as of last night and further detailed this morning, we've been informed by the Public Health Ontario Lab, we now have eight additional cases in Ontario of the UK variant, the B117. Um, and uh, so that means we now have 14. Uh, it's very likely we have more that we're not aware of. Uh, in those new eight uh Five of them are uh, connected to a, a recent traveler from the UK. The other three at this point, uh, we have been unable to get any evidence of travel, although um, the health unit is continuing to interview the uh, people again, because I think it's important for people to understand how important it is to be open about a recent travel, uh, even though they think maybe that might get them into some uh, trouble. Of course, it would not. Um, so, I mean, the vaccination program is going as quickly as it can, uh, given the supply issues, given um, prioritizing populations. So we are prioritizing, as you know, the most vulnerable populations, the long-term care residents uh, and healthcare workers who work with vulnerable people, indigenous populations, and people who are um, patients of chronic home care. So those, as we get through those, uh, hopefully that will reduce the uh, rate of illness and uh, mortality or death in those populations. It will not give us herd immunity. So uh, in order to get, we believe, in order to get what we call herd immunity, we probably need 60 to 70% of the general population vaccinated. That won't happen for many months. And so uh, the variant is already here. We know it's, uh, the data shows, as Dr. Brown uh, indicated, it's probably at least 56% more transmissible. 
And uh, at this point, as I said, three of our cases, we don't have a travel history. Um, if, if, that, uh, is, if that's confirmed, uh, we have evidence then of community transmission. And that is a very uh, serious concern um, that the vaccine will not be able to address quickly enough. I don't know if, Dr. Brown, I think I've covered it. Follow Thank up. You. The November modeling had the curve flattening at just under 1,500 cases. Um, the hotspots, so-called hotspots, have been in lockdown since the beginning of December. What do you think happened, especially considering some people will say this means the lockdown didn't go far enough, but others will say the broad-based lockdown doesn't work? Uh, I will I will start, and then I'm sure others will want to add. Um, I, you know, I think people... I think people are tired. It's been a long time. We're all tired. We're all fed up. We want this thing to go away. Um, and as you can see from the data Dr. Brown showed, the mobility did not, did not change. People were out and about in the summer. And despite going into a uh, shutdown in the gray zones, people were still moving about. They were going to um, adjacent regions to go shopping. Um, they were out and about. And I think, and we know that a third of people, according to the survey, are not following public health measures. So I think what it shows is that the shutdown was not enough. We need, we need more stringent measures. The data is showing we're in a very uh, dangerous situation now. The number of cases is going up, the number of hospitalizations, ICU beds. We are in a serious situation, so we need more serious measures placed in, put in place. Next question. From Matthew Bingley at Global News. Hi, good afternoon, uh, good morning rather. Uh, my question is for Dr. Brown. Uh, just about the percent growth that you were going through, uh, you, you talked about the five to seven percent range. Where, in, in, because it will take uh, about two to four weeks before we see these latest restrictions to actually have any effect, where do you predict in that period that we will actually see uh, the, the, the growth rate go? So right now with growth consistently between 3 and 5%, if we don't see a big impact from the new variant, I think you'll just see it following right along between those two numbers. So not seeing any break. Uh, the point you're making is, is, is a very important one, a very sort of logical one. It takes a while for restrictions to aff affect what the uh, case rate looks like because People need to stop moving around. The contacts need to decline. Uh, that reduces the transmission, but all the people who are infected and now incubating will actually show up as case numbers. Follow up? Yeah, and just to follow up on, on again, on the growth rate, but then with the UK variant factored in, I, I'm just trying to see if you can drill down into that a little bit more about where, where we likely are with it actually factored in, do you, do you not know yet? Because I, I know we have about 14 cases, but you, Dr. Yaffe did mention that it is increasing and there likely are other cases out there. So uh, do you know sort of where that growth rate is affected with that variant at the moment? Sure, so we can't tell the exact component of the current growth that is due to the new variant and the current growth that is due to the existing variant. Um, what we are seeing though is a, a couple, three things that I think are important to sort of call out. The first is a number of areas of the province with very dramatic growth uh, in cases, which is similar to what we saw in the United Kingdom, even during their kind of lighter version of a lockdown, uh, which starts to suggest that we might be seeing this new variant in some of these communities spreading. It's hard to tell because we don't know about the uh, prevalence of the new variant yet. Um, the second thing is if the variant was imported into the province as early as October, you will see that curve now start slowly to edge up closer and closer to 6 and 7%. Uh, and you'll see that almost kind of uh, scary sort of almost near vertical looking curve uh, by the end of February. And it's just a matter of time as it corrects up so that by uh, the middle of uh, February, sorry, the middle uh, or end of January, as you're asking about, you'll see a much steeper curve of, say, perhaps 7% or higher. Next question. From Ashley Legasic at Newstalk 1010. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Yaffe, I'd like to start with you. You mentioned more serious measures needing to be enacted. What exactly would you suggest? Uh, 
Well, you've seen the the measures that were put in place in the other jurisdictions. Um, so I, the public health measures table uh, met and discussed uh, various options and pros and cons and the evidence. Uh, and those have gone forward through the chief medical officer uh, to cabinet and they will be announced uh, this afternoon at one o'clock. Follow up. Thank you. And we know how much older and immunocompromised people are being impacted in the hospitalization and death numbers each day. But if we continue on this track, I'm just wondering if you could reiterate how the ramifications to our healthcare system would impact an average healthy younger person. Um, I think uh, Mr. Anderson might answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think maybe the way that I would approach that is uh, to be very cautious about um, the discussion on how it might impact a younger, healthy person. Um, we are seeing uh, more morbidity uh, when it comes to uh, folks who, you know, when you're a bit younger, uh, you feel a little more immortal, um, and we're not. Um, and we are seeing uh, trends where uh, people who are younger um, getting COVID, and although uh, the mortality rate may not be as high, we certainly can see uh, continued morbidity for those, uh, for those people. Um, so there's really no one who should consider themselves uh, immune uh, until you've gotten your vaccine uh, around the impacts that COVID can have. Next question. From Mike Crawley at CBC News. Uh, yes, hi. So the government's putting a lot of emphasis on um, uh, sort of personal responsibility, people not following the guidelines as being a, a driving factor uh, from that survey data that you have. What, um, what evidence is there that Ontarians are any um, less likely to be following public health guidelines than other places? Or you know, could you try to explain to what extent is the lack of following the guidelines actually contributing to this uh, steep rise of infections that we've seen? Um, I'll start. I don't know what Dr. Mel may want to add. I'm not sure how we compare to other jurisdictions, uh, but um, we know that this infection is spread between people. And if you're not wearing a mask and uh, you're getting within two meters of somebody um, or you're going out when you're not feeling right, uh, all these things, that's how this, this infection spreads. And, you know, some people may have a very mild infection and they they may think, oh, this isn't, I, you know, I'm okay, I can go out, I can go to work. They may have a circumstance where they may not get paid if they're off sick. And that is a very, you know, important barrier that needs to be addressed so that people will do the right thing. They may be worried about being evicted from their home if they can't pay the rent, there may be issues in their workplace. Uh, people may be taking breaks and uh, having coffee together. Obviously, you can't wear a mask. So it's not like we're saying it's, you know, people are doing this on purpose. I think what we're saying is people need to be supported to do the right thing. And there also needs to be good enforcement of the measures that are put in place so that so that people understand, you know, some people don't think this is important. I do get a lot of emails from the public. Some of them are saying, you know, you're making this up. This is a conspiracy. Um, there isn't really anything happening. So, you know, it's hard to believe that anybody actually believes that, but they are. And uh, it's important for people to know this is real. The numbers that Dr. Brown showed, those graphs, those are people. They're not, they're not just numbers. Those are people. Those are your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, your children. And... We all need to take this very seriously. Um, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but you know, bottom line is people need to, it's, it's, it's in all of our powers to change our behavior and do what we can to prevent the transmission of this infection. Follow up. Uh, yeah, uh, so also to you, Dr. Yaffe, then uh, you mentioned how serious uh, a concern the, the uh, UK variant is. Um, my colleagues are reporting this morning uh, about uh, the discovery, really by accident, of, the, of some cases of, um, of B117 uh, that were detected, uh, you know, by a, by a bit of a fluke. Um, what 
efforts are you going to put forward to increase uh, surveillance of uh, of B117 to try to get an accurate sense of how widely uh, it's spreading? Uh, that's actually a very important question, um, and it's not just about that variant. Uh, viruses do mutate. Uh, the UK variant, well, B117, people from the UK don't like have being called the UK variant, but anyways, um, there's also a South African variant that's been found now in Alberta, and there may be other variants. So uh, doing active surveillance and looking at the genomic sequence of the virus is really important. And actually, I was just on the phone this morning with Dr. Allen, who's the chief microbiologist at the Public Health Ontario Laboratory. They are now testing 500 to 600 samples a week. Other labs are testing as well. And, uh, you know, luckily so far have only found a very small number. But they, are, they need to uh, start to gather the data together. And look, and they are working as well across the country with the National Microbiology Lab and other labs so that we can identify variants um, as soon as possible and understand uh, what their implications are. Next question. From Randall Denley at National Post. Please go ahead. Hi, I, I know you're uh, projecting significant additional long-term care deaths by mid-February. I wonder, are you taking into account the uh, plan to vaccinate everybody in the LTC hotspots? Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, we are. It's one of the reasons why we're presenting a very short-term projection there. Uh, even though with the plans to vaccinate uh, as much as possible within the long-term care homes, you're still going to see case growth. Uh, remember, in these hotspots, we're really only dealing with, I think, about a third of the long-term care homes across the province. Uh, and so you, know, you, have to, you have to contrast vaccination in the hotspots, outbreaks now spreading across the province. Uh, and really, by uh, February 14th, we do believe the case growth will be significant enough to continue to increase the rate of mortality. Uh, the basic point is that we're already, though, at 1,100 deaths. Uh, it's going to take a while to bend that curve uh, down. And really, when you, when you think about uh, these sorts of curves, they go up and then they come back down. They don't disappear all of a sudden. So you're actually going to be probably looking at that uh, growth and death uh, accelerating even after we get more and more penetration uh, with the vaccine. Follow up. I'm a bit surprised at the lack of evidence about where these infections are taking place, especially in regard to essential workplace uh, workplaces. Do you not have that evidence? Dr. Yaffe, maybe I'll turn out the uh, outbreak question to you. Public health units do um, follow up as much as they can, given the current uh, huge numbers uh, of cases in some health units, to determine was this person at work while they were infectious? Were they at work when they might have acquired the infection? Um, and there are certainly significant uh, numbers of cases that uh, are associated with workplaces. And then not only that, they spread it to their family and their household and others. So um, we know that workplaces can be a very important part, a source of uh, infection, as can other settings where people uh, congregate. Next question. From John McGrath, TVO. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering what the projections for deaths are uh, going forward. We've already passed 5,000. Uh, do we expect to see 10,000 people die in Ontario? Thanks. We haven't presented uh, overall death projections today, so I want to be careful about kind of putting an overall number on it. Um, what I think is important to look at is that slide of the daily deaths that uh, we showed that shows a, a continuing increase to really about uh, almost uh, 100 deaths a day uh, under, uh, under the current projections. If you start to think about that, that means that we're going to well uh, exceed any uh, sort of total out of the first wave. Uh, and uh, there is a chance, as particular as the epidemic curve comes back down, uh, to double or even uh, exceed that uh, 5,000 number. Follow up. You've both spoken today and, and previously about the need for strong uh, social supports, uh, including things like income supports, uh, eviction protections. Uh, 
if the plan the government chooses to move forward with does not include greater social supports and relies exclusively on business closures and, and restrictions on personal movement, uh, can that plan still work in the absence of social supports? I'll turn over to Dr. Yaffe to comment in a second, but I don't believe that it will. Dr. Yaffe. Yes, I, I agree with Dr. Brown. I think enforcement is obviously important, strict measures and enforcement thereof and, and clear communication, but also needs to be with support. And I do know um, the government has funded, I believe, 15 what we call high-risk neighborhoods. Um, and there is work happening around uh, supporting people in those neighborhoods um, around those kinds of issues. So um, it's an important component for sure. Last question. From Natasha McDonald at Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hello, um, my question is for Dr. Brown. Um, would you say this new modeling isn't dramatically different from uh, the one presented before the holidays? Like, as worrying as these projections are, is it fair to say you're not surprised that evidence was already pointing to the new perspective measures and the ones in place now? Uh, they, they're not substantially different. Uh, as we sort of move along these projections, you see continually sort of increasing curves, uh, and it's consistent with the experience that we've seen in other countries. Follow-up, and this is the last question. Uh, Quebec has vaccinated about half of its residents in long-term care. Here in Ontario, there's evidence that uh, hostile workers that aren't patient-facing have been vaccinated. Do you think it would have been helpful if the, the province had... Uh, concentrated its efforts only on long-term care residents and staff? Uh, the province identified four priority groups for the first phase, and uh, long-term care uh, residents are obviously a very important part of that, as well as healthcare workers who uh, work with patients, uh, Indigenous communities, and patients who are uh, getting chronic home care. Um, I think, as you know, one of the limiting factors at the beginning was that we were dealing with Pfizer vaccine, which uh, needs to be stored at minus 80 degrees centigrade, very special circumstances. And only very recently um, have, have we uh, determined um, a safe way to move the vaccine. So, and it couldn't be put in multiple locations. So we started with uh, the vaccine in hospital settings, which is not the usual way we deliver immunization programs. Um, and it was targeted to long-term care workers and hospital workers, particularly who uh, are seeing COVID patients either in the emergency room or the ICU or COVID units. Um, now we have de determined how to safely uh, move the vaccine. We have the Moderna vaccine. And so we are working very, very hard to get the vaccine into the arms of long-term care residents and those staff and essential caregivers who haven't re yet received it. Um, and the target is to get all of the long-term care uh, facilities in Toronto, um, Peel, York, and Windsor done by January 21st, and the remainder uh, hopefully by the end of this, this month. Thanks, everyone.